I will assume at this point you remember what the end body problem was about, and since I've shown it in several lectures, I probably don't have to show you the uh, original uh, Rust code anymore. Um, but here is our kernel uh, in the you know, uncompiled form. Uh, and so down uh, below, I've got uh, this function uh, global void calculate forces. The X and C there is to prevent name mangling, um, something that uh, is, well, helpful. Um, and uh, calculate forces takes an array of float four. Uh, and so this is a, a package of four floating point numbers, uh, a package uh, of three floating point numbers representing accelerations, and then uh, num points, because so as we know in, uh, in C or C++, um, we end up um, we end up with um, having to recognize that uh, there's no like inbuilt uh, length property for a, an array or collection. In the Rust example, I made my own point and acceleration types, but CUDA uses vector types, which are a group of n of the primitive types. So a float four is a grouping of four floats, and the components are x, y, z, and w. Uh, and there exist vector types for all the standard C primitives, int, uint, float, double, char, and some more, in sizes of one through four. It is a nice way to package up related uh, values without needing a custom structure, although you can send structures to kernels if you want. Because you know a position is four floating point numbers, I didn't need to write my own. There exists a float four. That's perfectly fine. Uh, and um, when we get to the host code, uh, which you may see is open there in a different tab, you'll see I've had to modify its representation of the data as well. Um, so uh, that gives us uh, some information about why the uh, calculate forces function signature looks the way it does. Uh, we get the uh, current position using the block index and we'll also get the uh, current acceleration using the block index. Uh, and then uh, for in i equals zero, i less than num points, i plus plus, we do body body interaction between the current point and the position in that vector. Uh, and we uh, pass in uh, you know, the uh, acceleration uh, as uh, well, I pointer to it. So it's updated, uh, and then we copy back the uh, accelerations uh, into the array when we're done. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that because um, you know, acceleration here is kind of like a simple type, um, on line 23, the assignment statement is a copy. So if you leave off the assignment statement on 28, we do all the calculations and we write them down and then immediately throw them in the trash, which you didn't want. Uh, so it is a copy, uh, you know, we're not taking a reference to it, um, so we have to copy it back when we're done. Could, could we, you know, skip that a little bit by you know, taking address of the you know, flow three acceleration vector at this particular end? Sure, fine, whatever, but I thought this was a little bit clearer to write. Uh, and then the other function uh, that is in here is prefix with device as, as opposed to global. Uh, and that means it is called from another function when running on the GPU. So it's called inside the already executing kernel. So a global function can call a device function. Uh, and that's what you want. Uh, the calculation of forces, so the calculate forces function is called from the host. Uh, and global functions can call device functions, but not other global functions functions. Device functions can call only other device functions. So it is. It makes it very clear where the entry points are from host code. Uh, and if you wanted me to put like object oriented programming uh, thoughts on it, then you would say, well, device functions are private. Not that I necessarily encourage you to think about it in an object oriented way. But if that makes sense to you, then you could think of it like that. Yep, uh, and the uh, extern C declaration at the beginning of the global function just disables um, name mangling or name decoration, which is the compiler trying to differentiate between multiple functions within the same name. If that's too compiler dark internals to wor uh, to worry about, um, just just put this magic spell extern C uh, in front of your global functions, uh, and it prevents the compiler from telling you it can't find the function by the name that you specified. I understand more modern versions of NVCC uh, may not have this problem, um, but we will uh, just put this in here to be safe. Uh, is it superstition at that point? Maybe. Um, are there worse problems we could have? Yes. Um, so we're going to um, use this kernel when we talk about launching uh, and how to launch a CUDA program. Um, but uh, for the moment, I will show you the uh, PTX, the compiled version.
Uh, and this was uh, compiled by the uh, NVCC compiler uh, and it used CUDA compilation tools release 9.1. Uh, and this is version 6.1 of MVCC. Uh, and as you can see, it is um, very much like assembly language. Uh, and you can see why I say that, you know, could you write it yourself? Sure. Do I think it's a good idea? No. Uh, because it's, it's really intense. Uh, as I say, an expert could possibly do a better version uh, of this, but uh, I doubt very much you are going to uh, find a lot of uh, benefit out of this uh, unless you are really, really deep into it. So this compiled version uh, of the kernel, uh, I've got it in the uh, EC459 course repository, so you can look it over if you wish. Uh, and uh, as I say, don't make it yourself. Make the NVCC build it for you, please. Uh, it, it is uh, much, much easier if you do that. All right, before we go on to discussing how to launch the kernel and uh, the, the other side of it, that host code component, uh, I want to take a minute to talk about how to write the kernel well. Uh, I debated whether this should go before or after the part about launching it, but uh, I think it makes sense to put it here because if the sequence in which you're going to write this is first I'm going to write the kernel and then I'm going to write the host code, it makes sense to write the kernel well to begin with. Uh, and so uh, this is more closely linked to the topic that comes before uh, than it would be if we put it after uh, the host code component. So to start with when you're writing a kernel, I mean, aside from the, you know, practice makes perfect kind of nature of it, uh, the most important thing is deciding what belongs in the kernel, right? Where does it make sense to... Um, to use this approach of putting it to GPU, right? Um, anything that would benefit significantly from the large number of execution units is a good candidate. So that's typically, you know, something that is a loop of some sort. Uh, you know, you have a lot of iterations of that loop. If the loops need to be sequential, that's no good. Um, that isn't something that you would want. Um, it wouldn't help. Um, if you need a little bit of coordination, you can achieve that. Uh, you know, there are barriers and similar related objects, uh, and that's not too different from the concept as we've seen it in the context of concurrency. So uh, having some coordination is not a deal breaker, but if it has to be sequential, then there's really no benefit to it. Um, if you wanted, could you make the n-body kernel a two-dimensional problem? The answer is, well, maybe. Um, in this kind of problem, I mean, it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, we could treat each pair of points, i and j, as a point in the kernel space, uh, in the work items. Uh, so each work item is a pair of points. In the uh, kernel that I just showed, an individual point is a work item, and then we calculate forces on it in the kernel from all things. Uh, and if we made each pair of points Points a point in the space, then what we do is calculate the uh, f the forces uh, and then sum them up somehow. Um, that would make it a two-dimensional problem, and you could think of it as a matrix rather than an array, and you could provide to CUDA and say, hey, I want you to think of it like this, and that might uh, increase the parallelism. Unfortunately, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, as far as we're concerned, the calculation of the body-body interaction for just one pair of points is a very small amount of work, um, tiny even. Uh, and having one item uh, representing each such calculation means there's a lot of overhead to compute and it doesn't really make sense. Uh, if the calculation of the interaction were more complex, like it took a long time to do it, then uh, this transformation might actually be an improvement. Uh, but in this scenario, it's not. So each work item has to be you know, a substantial enough chunk of work to make it worth your while. Uh, and just doing you know, one execution of that body-body interaction function, which is really not that many lines, uh, isn't, isn't reaching that bar. Uh, more dimensions. You can have a three-dimensional problem, but no more. Uh, you know, if you have a six-level deep nested for loop, I mean, you can have the outer three loops as your X, Y, and Z dimensions uh, in your program, uh, but the rest will be in for loops. Um, so you can't have everything, uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I suspect that this limitation, although it seems arbitrary, is because the GPUs were kind of intended, you know, it, at least at one point, for, you know, rendering graphics um, in, in three dimensions. So uh, at that point, Point, it sort of seemed logical and uh, this restriction has remained 
Um, that's only my guess. Uh, I can't say for sure that that's why it is the case. Maybe they just said, yeah, we have to cut it off somewhere, and three seems like a good amount. Uh, and that is equally plausible as an explanation. Of course, um, you can also flatten the dimensions of your problem a bit. If you have a matrix, you can send it into the uh, GPU as a one-dimensional problem if you want. Uh, as we know, a rectangular array is really just a linear array, and you know, having the two indexing uh, operators, uh, you know, square brackets around x and y, that's just notational convenience. Uh, and you could just as easily send it in as a one-dimensional array, uh, and you can do that kind of thing as well. Uh, if that's the case, you can avoid the need for a loop in your code. In the n-body problem, having more work items of smaller size is not an improvement because each work item would then be too small to be meaningful. However, that's not true of every problem. There will be problems, I'm sure, where splitting it up actually is of benefit. Consider something like brute forcing a password of just six characters. That's easy. Uh, you know, you're not exactly going to be uh, well, on uh, the cover of uh, I don't know, Forbes magazine for cracking a six-character password. Uh, but a one-dimensional approach might just generate, for example, uh, a uh, all possibilities and transfer that over. Um, you could generate uh, possibilities in kernel code as well. Um, so one starting possibility for each valid character in the first position, and then let the kernel loop over all possible values. Um, you might be able to improve that by generating starting possibilities in some 3D matrix for the first three positions, and then loop the kernel after that. Whether it's better or worse is something that needs testing, um, but ultimately you can't uh, necessarily uh, generate all possibilities in host code because there would be too many and it wouldn't fit in memory. Um, so it might be faster uh, if you flatten things, if you have more dimensions or fewer dimensions, uh, it would really depend uh, on how long it takes and uh, how much parallelism you can leverage. This isn't actually the best way to brute force a password, and that is something that we're going to talk about later. Um, another thing that we should be aware of when we do uh, an execution on a GPU is that uh, unlike a CPU, there's no branch prediction and there's no speculative execution. That means that branches are more costly than they would be on the CPU, uh, and in practice, the hardware will execute all the branches that any thread in a warp executed, which can be slow, and then it keeps only the results that are valid. So given something like this, you know, if condition is true, then A is incremented by 5 and B is incremented by 5 in the else case, what will happen is we're going to run both of those, uh, and then we will keep the result at the end that turns out to be correct. Uh, as you can imagine, that means there is perhaps a lot of extra work being done, depending, obviously, on you know, how many branches there are and how expensive those branches are. Uh, if they're not too complicated and they are not so long, I mean, fine, you know, we can live with it, but we do have to be careful uh, and we don't want to have a huge amount of unnecessary work. They get expensive quickly, so keep them minimal, avoid them if you can. Um, similarly, a loop uh, will cause the work group to wait for the maximum uh, number of iterations uh, of any uh, in the work item. So uh, if, uh, if the compiler can, it will try to unroll loops, which uh, we've talked about already as a compiler optimization, so that's not too bad. Uh, and if every, uh, if every run of the kernel is the same length in terms of loops, like we saw with the n-body problem, it is you know, uh, always for across the whole array of points, that's fine. But if it's variable, you know, some run one iteration of the loop and some run 10 iterations of the loop and some run a thousand iterations of the loop, uh, putting them all in the same work group means that we will wait for the slowest one, which is we wait for the one with a thousand, which is uh, a, a little bit sad. Um, you might actually choose to uh, group your work items uh, accordingly, but if you don't, then uh, you get you get the sad outcome where uh, everything is uh, at the speed of the slowest. Um, yeah, the, uh, the compiler, as I say, will try to uh, unroll a loop if it can. Uh, if it can tell 
that it's worth doing, uh, then it certainly will. And uh, the notes has an example of a function foo where uh, it's uh, for i less than 12, uh, as, as we see here, and the compiler will unroll that because it knows the length uh, and it knows how to do the calculation. And it says, yep, we're, uh, we're going to skip that. Uh, and we'll just uh, we'll just have it be uh, as if it were a sequence of statements directly. What about atomics? Well, race conditions still occur. Uh, I've mentioned already the idea that there is you know, the concept of shared memory. So uh, so shared memory is definitely a uh, possibility for a race condition. Um, if you want to concurrently add to the same location, then you have to use atomic functions, uh, and the atomic operations are usable on your standard primitive types, so ints, floating point, numbers, anything like that. Uh, and there are the usual operations for you know, add, subtract, minimum, maximum, increment, decrement, compare and swap, bitwise stuff. Everything that we are used to uh, for uh, you know, CPU-based atomic operations we have as well in, uh, in GPU land. So here's an atomic uh, example. Uh, and uh, what we'll do here uh, is we're going to do an atomic add. Uh, and uh, we're, we're just going to uh, do it using a compare and swap. Uh, and it uses integer comparison because uh, not a number is a thing. Just one of those like little tiny details that can really drive you nuts. Now, uh, so in the atomic add operation, we will try to do a compare and swap. Uh, and if we are uh, correct, and you know, our add works the way that we expect, then we're good. Uh, there's uh, a little bit of uh, conversion here where we are converting, you know, doubles as long longs and long longs as double. But you know, that part is is just noise. The idea being, here's a good example of how you could do an atomic operation. If you were trying to find the max or you're trying to add something to a counter, uh, then this is how you would do it. All right. So thus far, we've covered the theory and how to write a kernel. To make use of it, we actually have to look at the host code because a kernel on its own can't do anything. We have to prepare it and we have to launch it. So that will be the next thing that we discuss.